The following program is brought to you by the University of Alabama. Hi, welcome to Bookmark. I'm your host, Don Noble. Today's guest is Dr. Ed Bridges, for over 30 years, the director of the Alabama Department of Archives and History. After his retirement, drawing on his vast knowledge of Alabama history, Bridges has published his newest book, Alabama, the Making of an American State. Please join me as I speak with Dr. Ed Bridges here in the Tuscaloosa Public Library. Well, it's good to see you today. Thank you. It's pouring rain, <laughs> and you're having a busy day anyway, so thank you for taking the time. I appreciate the invitation. In. Thanks, Don. You and I have been acquainted for a long time in our various jobs around Alabama, but this is your first time on this show, in, in this spot. So for viewers, uh, what I know is you spent more than 30 years as director of the, of the archi history archives in Montgomery. But I don't know where you were before that. Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? Um, I grew up in Bainbridge, Georgia, which is just across the river on Highway 84, across the Chattahoochee from Dothan on the Georgia side. So it's the wiregrass uh, part of southwest Georgia. Uh, grew up in Bainbridge. I went to Furman University for my undergraduate degree, and I went to University of Chicago for my MA and doctorate. And then I came back south and uh, was working on my dissertation. Uh, I was working on the... American frontier at the time of the American Revolution, the southern front, which was the frontier then, and uh, was working in Georgia and uh, ended up uh, being offered a job at the Georgia Archives. And I worked there for six years and I really loved it. I was planning on being a teacher and I ended up doing archives work and I loved that intersection between history and the present. That, that the archives provides. And so I was assistant director there. And then I came to Alabama in 1982 after Milo Howard died. Uh, many people still remember Milo. He was a remarkable guy. Well, I know, not only have I stopped by the archives once in a while over the last 40 years, but I know lots of people working on books, people working on, on films, documentaries, all kinds of things have, have received a lot of help from you over, over all that time. Uh -huh. But now, instead of helping other people with their books, of course, you have your book, The Making, Alabama, The Making of a State. There have been histories of Alabama. Uh, Leah's, Leah Rawls Atkins' book, along with Wayne, and yeah. Wayne's book about the 20th century, Mills Thornton's couple of very good books about late 19th and early 20th century Alabama. Uh, but Clearly, you thought there should be a new one. Yeah, uh, if, if you think about it, in terms of having an overall history of the state written for the general public, we really haven't had one in over 50 years. Oh. Um, uh, so I, I really thought it, it was time to do that. But also, I mean, what was going on for me is um, I have spent much of my life trying to take the, the huge complex story of Alabama history and to turn it into something, reduce it to something that's understandable for the general public. We do that in exhibits, we do that in programs, and so when I retired in 1982, I've spent so much time doing this. I've gotten to love it, it's interesting, it's I, I like the people I study as well as the pe my fellow students of Alabama history. And I thought, well, a great thing to do in retirement is to try to see if I could take what I've learned and try to put it together into something that might be of interest to the general right. public. When did you retire? In uh, October 82. Not 80, 90, I mean, October 2012. 2012. I started, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Excuse oh. me. Thank you for correcting me. Oh, oh, happy. Uh, uh, <laughs> didn't I, I came here in 82 and yeah. I worked through 2012. And you've been retired just, yeah. a, just a few years. Yeah. So your book will be aimed not at a scholarly audience, but at a popular audience. And that, that's right. right. That's right. Yeah. Besides that variation on other, other books, in your introductory material, you suggest 
not heavily, but lightly, that Alabama's history is filled with more difficulties and conflicts, perhaps, than other histories of Alabama ha have dwelt on. Not that you're going to focus entirely on the negative, because you certainly don't, but you, I, maybe you paid more attention to Alabama's historical conflicts, your word, than other people have. Well, I, I, I mean, I think that's part of the drama of Alabama history. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I don't mean to be insulting, say, to people from Indiana, but I mean, you think about the story of Indiana. People go there, that they grow corn. There's a story? <laughs> I mean, they grow corn, they have go yeah. good corn crop after another, yeah. and they've been doing that for almost 200 years. Uh, uh, um, you know, and occasionally the, it, the, their sons will go off to war, and they've always won. And, you know, here we've had the, the, in, all these struggles, these I mean, they did have an Indian struggle in, in Indiana, but we've had a really remarkable story about struggle with Indian history, then the development of slavery. It, it takes us in one way while the rest of the world is moving toward a free labor model. Uh, so we have that conflict. We have the racial conflict. Uh, we, we have the efforts to, to kind of the efforts of white Alabamians to maintain a separate way of life that's at odds with the rest, odds with the rest of the nation. So we've just had this period, these cycles of conflict, yeah. which are the, you know, that's the source of the drama, though. That's why it is so interesting. I mean, yeah. you, 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 you don't have, you don't have a, you don't have a great play until you have a great, uh, you have struggle and you have conflict. And I think that's one of the reasons Alabama history is so interesting. Oh, I think if you're going to write history, <laughs> you're, you're better off in Alabama than yeah, you are yeah. in Indiana or, yeah. or other states that have I's and O's, Yeah, where I, I have no clue what goes on there, but yeah. I'm not curious about it. There's Ohio and Iowa. Anyway, not our subject. Yeah. <laughs> Your early chapters, you know, in all my years of living in Alabama, I, I suffer from a general delusion that I know something about uh, Native Americans. I've been to Moundville, but your book told me more, taught me more about uh, Indian life in Alabama than I had read anywhere else in, in all these years. It, it was bigger, in, in Native American culture, civilization, urbanization was bigger and better than anybody imagined. And, and it's such a long and rich and interesting story. Just think about it. Uh, so we've been a state for maybe for 10 generations, roughly 10 generations. Yep. And the Indians have been here for roughly 700 generations. Oh. 700. Think about it. 10 versus 700. Uh, when they first came here, they it was still Stone Age. They were hunter-gatherers, like most people all over the world at the time. And they went through this whole process process of developing tools, adapting to the land, developing agriculture. And, you know, by 1500, they had a very complex, rich civilization here in Alabama that, I mean, one of the reasons we don't know that much about it is because it was eviscerated by the, the, the deaths, a massive death toll that these European diseases took. Think 90% of a population or so yeah. gets wiped out by disease. I mean, right. that the, the Black Death, the, you know, the, in Europe may have had, what, a third of the population? And then it, 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 it changed Europe for hundreds of years afterwards. And, and here's 90% of a population wiped out. Yeah. I, I, books that, that uh, are now, especially the last few years, studies of, of New England, studies of, of uh, literally the Massachusetts Bay Colony and the Plymouth Colony, yeah. the, the, the myth that we have loved so much that, that uh, when Europeans came to North America, it was empty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was almost empty because they had 90% of the Indians had died in the, just the last few years before 1620. That's right, that's right. But yeah. down here, it, took, it was later... Or early? No, no, no. Where did the, uh, where did the, the European the, diseases I mean, come from here? The, I mean, you had DeSoto coming through here in 1540. Uh, and there were probably even, there was contact with Spanish explorers along the coast uh -huh. even before that. So these diseases were probably sweeping up through Alabama even before DeSoto arrived. So, I mean, there, there, there uh, comparisons uh, between DeSoto was here in 1540 and DeLuna came back 1560, 1561. Right. And the DeLuna accounts uh, show people traveling 
for days and days and days without encountering anybody. Yeah. Because there was such a massive loss of life. There was no resistance at all. Right. Was there? Just amazing. And my, my, my favorite illustration of that, you know, is the land was so deserted that the buffalo from the west were migrating back into the south, grazing <laughs> on these old fields that the Indians had once tended that had, had all grown to, back to grass, and, and the buffalo were grazing on them. I had no idea. Yeah. I like it. It's a nice mental picture yeah, though, isn't it? Yeah. Buffalo wandering around, say, Utah yeah, Alabama, or here in Alabama, yeah. Greensboro. Yeah. <laughs> well, they will again one day. <laughs> one day. The treatment of the Indians is something that most people, uh, Andrew Jackson, the Creek Wars and so on, it was even, and the, and the removal, even worse than we thought, even worse than lay people imagine it to have been. I don't know how bad people imagine it to have been, but it was pretty horrible. I mean, even after all this and a after the broken treaties, the intrusions on Indian land, the, uh, the, the, the fraud that was perpetrated on individual Indians, they tried to the use of alcohol to try to, to influence them and the destruction of Indian families and the conscious building of debt in order to leverage land out of them. After all that, then you get the removal. And, and, and it's just a horrible story. You know, we, we round up these Cherokees, for instance, and put them into containment camps, you know, that are almost, uh, and, then, and then they get marched out. The, uh, the government um, hires contractors who are to provide food and clothing along mm -hmm. the way, and the contractors fail to meet their obligations, or they give them bad, spoiled food. It, oh, it, you know, then they, they die by the hundreds. Yeah. I mean, it was it was pretty horrible. Yeah. It, very few managed to hide out or or stay in the state. We still have a few pockets, but yeah, that's it's right. not much. Baldwin County or Jackson County, and yeah. then well, and, and then, then you've got the Porch Creeks Porch. and other groups, and yeah. and then there were there were Indians who had intermarried with both white and black Alabamians, and and their DNA still courses through the <laughs> veins of many people in Alabama today. A lot of people now are very proud of their Indian ancestry. Moving into the er, second, third decades of the nineteenth century, something that Every once in a while, I get reminded of this. Your book reminded me uh, again. Cotton really made people rich. Richer than I had. Yeah. It's hard to hold it in your head how plantation owners in the Black Belt and in Mississippi as well yeah. and elsewhere, just how fabulously wealthy they were. Yeah. Our mutual friend John Hall once said that Alabama was the Saudi Arabia of cotton, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, that kind of catches it. it it, um, I've, I've seen some plantations where owners were able to double their money every year, for, oh, you know, really? in, 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 in good cycles for year after year. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't take long doubling your money every year. To, you're, you're pretty comfortable. I'm not saying they could do that all the time, yeah. but there was that kind of, of, of increase of wealth that was just pretty amazing. Yeah. Novelists once in a while will move into this territory risking, of course, incredulity. All the furniture comes from, from, from Europe. Yeah. All the wine comes from Europe. All the clothing yeah. comes from Philadelphia or New York or Boston or Europe. But it was, the steamboats brought them right, right, yeah. to, right to the yeah. dock. I mean, it's just, it's just odd to think of these, of these planters unloading cases of Beaujolais <laughs> around Greensboro or wherever. <laughs> and even ice, you know? They would take blocks of ice no. cut in New England, like Walden, you know, that Thoreau yeah, talks yeah, about, yeah. put it on ships, carry it down to Mobile, ship it up rivers, and so planters could have ice. No wonder they were reluctant <laughs> to end slavery. Yeah. You, I'll bet, I'll bet that in the course of this show over the last many years, the subject of slavery has come up and you won't be surprised by this, but half the people that, if the subject comes up from a novelist or from a historian, about half the people I talk to say, well, it really wasn't that bad, you know. Yeah. Um, I could name names, <laughs> but that would, be, that would be wrong. 
But they'll say, oh, no, no, most people only own one or two, and they treated them very well, or they were like family, they ate at the, they ate at the table, uh, everybody loved one another, and so on. But your book doesn't fool with that idea. I mean, slavery was run by the whip. Well, you know, there, there undoubtedly were cases where people yeah. lived together, uh, black and white, master and slave, uh, in a mutually respectful and even affectionate relationship. Um, but the great engine that drove cotton production uh, and all that increased wealth was systematic use of, uh, in, in, Al in Alabama slavery, they were using the practices of the Industrial Revolution in agriculture. So the practices mm. of measuring each ah. production each day, how many pounds of cotton did you pick? You, you weigh it, you write it down. This person picked 120 pounds yesterday, 118 pounds the day before, and you set a goal for the next day there to do 125 pounds. And if they don't, if they don't meet that goal, then they're disciplined. It may be you know, food is withheld, it may be privileges are taken away, but it, but it was often the whip. And, and there's a whole literature of plantation management that talks about how to do this. Just like, you know, we, we read books today about best management practices, you really? know, how to make your organization really kick. And, well, uh, they, they had that kind of literature, and you can read the literature. You can go to the plantation records, and you can see the daily production reports for each person each day. In fact, I've got one of those in the book. I've got, you know, just look at this farm, and you so, can see the production. So the plantation management for dummies? <laughs> and then, and then, and then yeah. how to manage your plantation, the art of the plantation deal. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I mean, so, so, I, I no mean, and, 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 and so the wealth that you were talking about a minute ago was based on this. In fact, um, the product productivity by the 1850s, the productivity of Afri enslaved African American workers on plantations was so high, the, the, they, the, there were people who could pick cotton with both hands, operating independently like, like virtuoso piano players, and some could <laughs> pick up to 300 pounds a day. And, and those rates have never been equaled in human history, not in India, not no. China, any other place. They've <laughs> never equaled those production rates. Right. Uh, that's wonderful, I had no idea. Yeah. Uh, efficiency. What, it, it, Slavery is portrayed often as, as um, uh, kind of a patriarchal, lot of, like the like a European manner, uh, like uh, Sir Walter Scott and all the happy peasants, right? Yeah, and all, but also that uh, that the slaves are in resistance, and that and that they they try to do as little as possible, or as little. Well, apparently that just wasn't on. They were work. They were worked to, to the max. Uh, they were put. I mean, that's where you made your money. You know, wow. that 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 was the, the margin. If you could, if you, if you got a hundred pounds more production out of each slave each day, you know, it's that margin is where your right. big profit is. Right. You know. Well, no, no wonder people. The the Civil War is a is a. By the way, are you are you in the camp that is willing to say the Civil War was fought? to retain the institution of slavery? Or are you 50-50, or no. where, where are you on that exactly? Well, I mean, I, I think it would be fair to say that without slavery, there would not have been a civil war. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so when it came down to the actual decision to secede, it was a combination of you know, our honor's at stake, our rights are at stake, uh, and all of these kinds of things that you, uh, that you invoke when somebody else is attacking your way of life. Mm -hmm. But the reason, the, the reason that that way of life was at issue was slavery. Yeah. And so to, to, say, I, to say that the Civil War was not about slavery, I think, is is just disingenuous. Yeah. Among the conflicts, you have 
we have Jim Crow, black and white. We have slavery. We have we have Europeans and Indians. We have a, 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 the whole question of slavery and <clears throat> abolition as a conflict. We have we have uh, in Jim Crow. We have segregation with all of its conflicts. But but one of the things that runs one of, a theme that runs through several of your chapters is the yeoman farmer, as a who has a, a set of values and a set of political needs and the planter or the yeah yeah and the planter gets that planter side gets entered into also by industrialists yeah that's an ongoing uh, source of tension I, I, absolutely absolutely I, I mean if you think about it, so Alabama was settled right after uh, the Creek War in 1814 and the, the, the leading people of the state right off the bat were the big planters who really were tended to be the, the sons and grandsons of Virginia planters who had moved on there. But th they were just a minority of the population and this was the age of Thomas Jefferson and so Alabama opened the vote to, to everybody, all, I mean, all white males, all white males could vote in Alabama. It was, the, the 1819 Constitution was very liberal about that. And the majority of people in, in Alabama, the majority of voters by far, were non-slave-holding small farmers who depended on the works of their own hands. And so immediately after, um, after uh, the, the first government was formed in 1819, there was a terrible worldwide recession, the Panic of 1819. The bank of Huntsville that was owned by the rich people who were planters and connected with politics, the bank of Huntsville had all kinds of problems. It refused to redeem its money. It was calling in loans. And these politicians started saying, that, appealing to the, the ordinary yeoman farmer white saying, look what these rich people have done. They have been using their position in government, they've been using their position as heads of the bank to benefit themselves at the expense of other people. They've been exploiting us and let's throw them out of office. And so, I mean, Alabama's born in that kind of politics. You know, uh, almost a decade before Andrew Jackson and the politics of the common man starts nationally in the 1828 elections, Alabama is already having that fight, and it goes all the way through. It, 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 it's the core struggle for the entire antebellum period, and then it reshapes, you know, in the years afterwards. It shows up in the populist uprising in the 1890s. It shows up again in Big Jim Folsom in the 1940s and 1950s. You know, it's, it's, it, like you said, it's this continuing thread through Alabama politics. One, one of the innings, the 1901, <laughs> <laughs> Constitution yeah. inning sort of changed the score considerably, though. Yes, it did. Re it did. Rewrote the rules. <clears throat> a couple. Of, we're we're going to run out of time inexplicably, but I have a question that's yeah. on that's on my mind. Recently, uh, there's been a lot of work done on the bank heads. There's a nice yeah, documentary yeah. made about the bank heads. There was a moment when Alabama had enormous political power <laughs> yeah. in Washington. Yes. We had a, 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 well, we had a senator and a congressman. Well, not just a congressman, he, but, but he was the Speaker, speaker of, of the House, House of Representatives. Right. Yeah. Now, we got a road. <laughs> we got the highway. Has Alabama, over, over time, we've had a lot of political power in D.C. Has Alabama profited, not just at the present moment, that's, that's really not my question, but even back in the 30s, when, 40s, when we had so much weight, so much clout in D.C., yeah. did, we, did we benefit from that? Well, <laughs> look at the Tennessee Valley today and think about we wouldn't have Huntsville without the federal government. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have the Space and Rocket Center there, so yes. the R Redstone Arsenal, the, the, all the dams of the TVA, all the industries right, that have right. developed there. Or, or look at Mobile and think about what shipbuilding and Brooklyn Air Force Base, wow. and, you know, uh, to say nothing of all these other federal programs like you know the Hill Burton Act for hospitals and health care, right. sponsored right. by right. Senator Lister Hill from so, Alabama, the Bankhead Cotton Control Act. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So, can we inform Alabamians that the federal government has been our friend? Well, it it, 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 it is a strange kind of thing. It, it, there are different. Of statistics that you see on this, 
uh, and it depends on how it's all calculated, but roughly we get back about a dollar and a half in services for every dollar we send to Washington. Right. right. And some some calculations say it is as much as two dollars and a quarter or something like that for right, every dollar. Right, we, right. So the, we've been getting a pretty good deal from the federal government uh, in terms of 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 our what we send and, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe I don't know. So why is it we dislike the federal government so much? I guess it's because these services come with controls. They come with uh -huh. restraints, uh, and, and and so even even. Even when you're accustomed to getting help, um, you know, maybe if it comes with controls, you start resenting it over time. You, you, you take you take I the gift it. for granted, yeah. but you bolt you you uh, uh, kind of resent and resist right. those those in, in, controls. We have one minute left. Oh, <clears throat> and this is. This borders on unfair, but uh, but here you are. Alabama's future. You are a historian, and obviously an archivist and a historian. The past is your is your bailiwick, but but you cannot study three four hundred years of Alabama history and come up to the present moment, which your book does, without thinking where are we headed. Uh, <clears throat> I don't mean just are you an optimist or a pessimist, but but w in one minute. How do you feel about Alabama's near future? Well, I mean, I, one of the reasons I write this book yeah. is because I think it's in our hands, and I think we have to make the future. And in order to make the future a successful one, we have to learn to work together. We have to be creative. We have to be intelligent and smart in ways that we often haven't been in the past. And I think if we can look at our past, we can see what works and what didn't work, we can see the things that pit us against each other and divide us, I think we have a better chance to, for building the kind of future that we all want for our children and their children. I'm not sure if you just told me you were an optimist or not. I, 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 it's in our hands, you know. <laughs> it's up to us. It's in our and, hands. Is that a good I'm, thing? I'm, I'm trying to do everything I can, uh -huh. and, and, uh, and uh -huh. I hope you are, and, and I hope everybody listening and watching will do their best. But, but the it's, it's a wonderful state. The potential we, is here. We can do it. We can do it. We can make this a better place. That is a wonderful closing line. <laughs> and thank you very much. This, this has been a pleasure. Thank you, Don. And thanks for inviting me.